In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. And the Word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray. Pour forth. We beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross we be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Mother of divine grace, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so here's the questions. If your boys are already teenagers, is it too late to make them men? If not, how do you do it? Well, it really boils down to, you know, when they're younger, before they reach the age of puberty, if you're already having them doing things that are kind of difficult, but not beyond their state, if you're having them kind of do a few things that are kind of difficult, they kind of already get into the habit of it, and they kind of realize this is part of life, and so when they get into the teenage years, um, and you explain why, and they see the rationale behind it, they'll actually want to do those things that are difficult. But if they're not, uh, if, they, if you, they didn't receive that when they were younger, you're kind of fighting a bit against the tide, because what's happened is, is that they've gained uh, moral and intellectual habits that you have to start working against. But that means, ultimately, that you have to, it has to be more of one of counsel, that is, tr- um, is giving them the knowledge about why they have to do these things and why they have to become this way in order so that they can find fulfillment themselves in this, in being a real man. So there's that part. And that just comes then you have to start giving them responsibility. You have to start asking them to do things that are difficult. They have to understand the why of it because if you don't give it to them, you just start telling them this is what you have to do, they're not going to understand it and they're just going to rebel. But if they understand why it's important for them to do that, then um, you might get some bickering. But even that, you know, complaining and com- uh, for a guy is, is, uh, is a feminine. I mean, when I, um, you know, when I used to work for my father, in the summers, I'd work 40-hour weeks. So he was a mechanic. And when, uh, you know, you just never complained about the work. You might kind of sit and kind of relax a little bit to get recouped, but you would never complain about it. So when you hear these guys whining all the time, and just like, man, you're sounding like some kid who's four or five. So, but the point is, is that it's just a matter of getting them to recognize it and be willing to come up to speed. If they're not willing to come up to speed, they're not going to come up to speed. St. Thomas asked the question, can you beat your son even if he hasn't done anything wrong? <laughs> and he says, well, no, not normally, because the, it really beating somebody is a punishment, and punishments are really the result of a crime. So unless he, if he hasn't done anything wrong, then you shouldn't beat him. He says, unless he needs discipline. He says. So, and by the way, I'm not suggesting you beat your sons. But what I am suggesting is, is that you do have to, get, you have to, they have to start, you have, you have to just talk to them. This is what it means to be a man. This is what you're going to have to start doing. And you have to come up to speed on it. So maybe give them a, co- maybe a copy of this conference will help them a little bit. I don't know. So, okay. Um, could you restate the definition of fear? Is that fear or shame? So, well, I'll do both. Fear is um, defined by St. Thomas as the perfect, the emotion that arises as a result of the perception of a future evil which you cannot overcome. So that's the emotion that arises when you see something evil and you know you're not going to be able to overcome it. Uh, shame is the perception, the, the, the fear of being perceived as lowly. So... Um, I won't talk about it too much, but that's one of the things demons really suffer from, is that shame, that really being afraid of being seen for what they are, that they're nothing. Um, 
You have mentioned the need to raise from childhood manly boys. What is the best way for a man who has grown up effeminately to become manly? What support can women... Okay, so let me just answer that question. The first thing is start doing things that are hard and difficult. Start really working on virtue, your prayer life. Um, start doing the thing, you know, if something is difficult, don't sit there and say, I'll get to it tomorrow. Do it now. Start getting that into your self-discipline and that self-control in relationship to all matters. That's really what you need to start working on. And you can do that in a variety of different ways. Um, what support can women give to support a feminine man in becoming virtuous, self-sacrificing, and responsible? It's called a rolling pin. You beat him over the head. No. Um, it's... Uh, I think that there's two parts to it. Is the first part is if a man recognizes that there, let me just put it this way: there's real shame and real embarrassment in a man who his wife or the girls around him don't think he's a real man. Now he might not say it, but there's a kind of a shame. Like eh, I feel pretty bad about that. And he may not show it. He may, in fact, not still continue acting, but. but there's something to that, that side. So first is just tell them, look, this is what we're perceiving. You need to kind of man up here. The second part of it is is um, the men need to know what virtue is. And I think, some, you know what I've found a lot of times is just telling a guy, look, the part of being a real man is self-sacrifice and self-interior discipline and control. And immediately guys will, boom, yeah, that's it. That's what it is. So it's usually, there's almost a natural inclination to recognize what that is. And so once they, rec then from there, once they see that, then you can start unpacking it. Well, then that means that, you know, you don't lay around on the couch. You go and mow the lawn. You don't make me mow it. You know, you, then that also means that, you know, this, the, the fence in the backyard needs fixing or something of that sort. So in other words, you have to kind of show them this is the virtue, this is what you need to attain, and then this is the way you need to do it. Um, the responsibility part, and this is the real problem is, is that when men... For a guy, if he, if it, it's much easier for a guy who's always had to be masculine to maintain masculinity than it is a guy who is effeminate to try and finally attain it because he's constantly working against the ingrained habits and dispositions in relationship to it. Sometimes I just tell him, you know, go out and do something as simple as go and lift weights. I mean, not that that's going to make you a man, but that, that denial of yourself to do those things will. So it's not, the, it's not becoming strong. And that's one of the things I often tell um, when I give this conference um, privately, because I've given this conference privately in different forms. I'll tell guys, you know, lifting the weights and getting the form isn't what makes you a man. What makes you a man is the self-discipline in getting there. That's the real issue. So, and one of the signs that you know that the guy isn't in it for the self-discipline is, is you'll go to these gyms, and the guy's standing in front of his, in the mirror doing this and looking at himself and feeling his muscles and looking at, you know, and you know, get, all of that. And, and then another thing that's really effeminate in men is the piercings and the tattooings. And people say, well, why is that effeminate? Well, okay, but go back to Adam and Eve. Eve was designed to have an inclination to be concerned about her parents so that she would be judged properly. That means that women are more designed for that. Guys, on the other hand, are designed to judge. To, to judge. Right. So that being the case, this is one of the reasons why when men don't moderate that, that's why they call it ogling. Right? There's oogling. They're like, mm, okay, buddy, get it under control. Okay. The other side of it, though, too, is, is that's one of the reasons why women are more concerned about their parents. When guys, you know a society is starting to become effeminate and collapsing in its masculinity. When guys start wearing bling or wearing things, you know, earrings and all these chains and everything, the only time in the past that a man wore any piece of jewelry is if it was a sign of some excellence. And by excellence, we mean like he would wear a wedding ring because wedding is being married is an excellence. Or he was a bishop and he held a specific office or things of that sort. That's the, that's the only time he wore that stuff. In the, so, in the, you know, when I grew up, if some guy, if some guy would have came to school with, with earrings, he would have been beat within an inch of his life. <laughs> And guys would have been taunting the living daylights of him. Oh, you're a girl now, I see. Because that's what women do, right? Okay. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that either to guys that are that way. But the point is, is that, that's, that's, that when guys are worried about the appearance, the externals, not the internal part, that's another sign of the effeminacy. So that's one of the things he's going to have to really struggle to overcome is a lot of guys have to really work on that, putting aside, I mean... 
in the past, the only reason a guy worried about his appearance is for the sake of other people, not because he was worrying about himself. He would, you know, make sure his hair was properly combed or he had it was properly shaven, etc., or his beard was trimmed in order so that when he went to work, it would set the proper example and the proper image rather than, you know, walking in as a slob. Okay. Um, so how do you help them? They have to see what the virtue is, and they and you have they have to see the value of attaining it and what's necessary. You have to have to see them to attain it. So that may come at a certain price on your part as a woman because you're going to have to. Um, pray a lot and do a lot of penance for him so that he receives the grace to do it. I think that that's kind of the stage where we're at, where people are going to have to receive, men are going to have to receive the grace in order to see the value of actually really being a man. What can you do if you are uh, unevenly yoked with your husband and need to implement some of your suggestions? Uh, limit pleasures of videos, chores, or prayer? Yes, yeah, all of the above. You have to get your husband... Well, again, having listened to this conference, you know, one of the advantages of being a priest and being an exorcist is that you can dress guys down who are three times your size and there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> okay. And I've had to, had to do that a few times with guys. They just tell them, hey, man, man up. This isn't the way it works. You're going to have to pray. If you want your wife to stop being possessed, this is what you're going to have to do. Well, I'll just, I don't want to hear it. Right, so, and you can get away with it as a priest. I'd probably still do it anyway, because some of these guys, even though they're you know, bigger than you, they're still effeminate. But the point is, is, is that they need to, you know, listen to the conference and then see the value of it. But they also need to recognize part of being a man is self-sufficiency. When you are tied to a piece of technology, like a phone or a... Um, and here I'm not talking about necessarily to do work, but, you know, or to the computer, you're constantly playing video games... That's a sign you're chained to the thing. That's not, that's not being a man and self-sufficient. You're dependent on this thing. So sometimes you can appeal to them in different ways, but I think the main thing to do is to, um, is to inform them, you know, well, this is what effeminacy is. is or just define, this is what St. Thomas defines as effeminacy, and then tell them what Vogelin says. Vogelin says we get a pleasure out of using technology, which I think is absolutely true. How do I know for sure if my physical attraction towards my wife is virtuous? Um, if it falls within the confines of the natural law and what the church says is listed for you to to desire or want in that, in that respect. So, um, in other words, the physical attraction, there should be a certain kind of physical attraction between men and women. I mean, God put it there for a reason. The problem is it has to be moderated. So there's two parts of it. The end, is it or rightly ordered? The second thing is, is, is it moderated? Is it, is it out of control? You know, that you're constantly pawing her and being at her? Well, then that's a sign you've got to get that under control. If it's the type of thing, too, like guys are asking wives to do things that are completely contrary to the natural law, and the church has come out very clear on some of these and said, no, you can't be doing those things. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that is getting misrepresented in, in some of the mainline media, even among Catholics, even those who claim to be orthodox are saying, oh, well, you can do these kinds of things, and it's okay as long as it does this. And you're like, no, that's not at all what the tradition has said or the church herself has said. So um, that's, a, that's a whole different conference. But I think that, that it's, if it's moderated and rightly ordered according to the natural law, then you know that that attraction is virtuous. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, if it lies, it's moderated. How detailed should confessions of sins of impurity be? Uh, the Council of Trent states that you have to confess the lowest, when it comes to mortal sins, not venial. Uh, oh, okay, let me say this. For unconfessed mortal sins, you have to, the Council of Trent says you must confess the lowest species. What does that mean? It means you have to basically confess the the nature of what you did. So sometimes people, the common one, the very common one that you get when you hear confessions a lot is people come and say, I was impure. Well, impure is a pretty broad category. I mean, it could be everything from passionate kissing all the way to fornication. So what, what are we talking about in here, right? So if it's an unconfessed moral sin, you have to say, well, we engaged in foreplay or something like that so that the priest knows because the requirement is so that he can assign a proper penance. The other thing is, too, is the church is trying to avoid the violation of integrality. They do want to make sure that you're not hiding some sin behind some vague um, confession of it. If it's already been confessed, then you can say, for all the sins of my past life, especially those against uh, purity, you can do that. 
um, if it's already been confessed. But otherwise, it has to be um, it has to be the lowest species. You don't go into detail about what you did during that um, because that's not appropriate and it's not what's necessary. So the church says lowest species. So, and I always tell people species, number, and circumstances. So, because that's what Trent said. So, species, what you did, what you did, not some vague generality, but what you did. The second thing is any circumstances that would make it worse. So, for example, if a guy murders somebody and he says, "Well, I, and so I didn't shoot the guy in the head. I actually, you know, did the Chinese water torture until he died." Okay, well, that's pretty bad. Uh, then the other one is um, the intention, you know, if that changes the nature of what you did. So that's what you want to um, you want to actually uh, confess. What should you do if you have a young child under 10 who often expresses anger to his siblings and parents? Um, first, let me make an observation about anger. It's a perception that anger is actually a sign of callousness. That's not true. Callousness is really the sign of the guy who's phlegmatic who doesn't even care what happens to anybody. Anger, because it's a perception of injury, it means there's a sensitivity there. And that sensitivity is not necessarily a bad thing. Because I know guys who are very manly but very sensitive. But they have to, it, that sensitivity has to be subordinated to uh, virtue and right order and what the situation is so that they don't be, end up becoming angry. So most of the guys that you find have a real problem with anger, there's some kind of woundedness or sensitivity underneath. So in relationship to the child, sometimes you have to find out where's the woundedness. Is there some kind of woundedness? Or is it that just he's just not getting what he wants and so he's perceiving that as some injury? And if that's the case, and there's a real crucial period in a, in a man's life. There's actually two of them. Well, there's several, but these are the two main ones. The first one is the stage between about 9 and 15, about 14, depending on his maturity level, where he makes the transition from being a, a bag of emotion to one following reason. That transition very often is hallmarked by the fact that the kid is just an emotional basket case. And parents will say, what is it, about 10 years of age? The kids are just, they're, just, they, they're bawling all the time. And that's, well, he's at that critical stage, right? And as he goes through puberty, he has to learn to subordinate his emotions to reason. Okay. The other time is uh, after he's come out of puberty, there's a maturation period of about two years. And if he doesn't come up to speed, mature-wise, in that first two years, it's unlikely that he's going to rage or attain without some type of severe penance or some type doing a lot of work. He's ever going to really attain true masculinity um, as far as subordinating his emotions and his appetites before then. So, I mean, it can happen. I've seen it happen much, much later, but there's that critical period. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, I tell people, look, nature was designed, if you look at nature, just look at it, you see that women go through puberty about a year before men, a year, year and a half. And then there's about a two to three year maturation period for women. So let's just take around age of 14 to 15. Then there's a year, two, year, two to two and a half years. So basically by the time a woman reaches the age of 18, she should be to the point where she's gone through puberty, she's mastered the emotions in relationship to what she's just gone through, and so now she's ready for marriage. The man, it's a little bit more delayed. Um, there's a reason for that. I don't want to get into it. But it, basically, for men, it's the, the puberty is a little bit later, and then the maturation period is also about two to three years. So for a guy, it's about 17 to 19. What's happened is, is that that maturation period after going through puberty is being put off where people are never maturing because they never have to grow up. And that's the problem that we're actually seeing with that. That being said, I tell people, look, if nature was intended... For, and people, people, will tell, people will say, well, wait a minute, are you suggesting that people should get married with the ages of 18 to 19? Do you know what the definition of a spinster is, I asked them? A spinster is a woman who's 22 years old and unmarried. That's the definition of a spinster. Okay, so what does that mean? So, by the way, I don't mean to impugn anybody here. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes women aren't married because there's no men. I mean, there might be all these boys running around that they're her age, but there's no men, so that can be the other problem. 
But the point is, is that that nature is ready for people to start um, having children by the time, you know, both uh, physical, physiologically and maturation-wise, by the time the woman is, you know, 17 to 18, and men are 18 to 20. And then we delay it until they're in their 30s before they even get married, and then we wonder why there's so much fornication. Well, excuse me, but nature is ready to go. These people should have maturation to the point where they're ready to get married. And this is one of the reasons why I think that, you know, when people say, so you think people should get married at the age of 18? Yeah, oh, look, hello, when my parents grew up, if you were 18 and you graduated from high school, it was either to college or marriage or a job, or, and you were kicked out of the house. So the fact that we, and, I, and by the way, this isn't, this isn't so, well, the age is different. No, the difference is, is how we raise people. Let me give you an example. There's some very close friends of mine. And um, uh, my, her, her father, the, the woman in the marriage, her father was one of my best friends in life, probably the best friend I ever had in my entire life. And he, um, he had these daughters, and the daughter met this guy. And uh, I, I started referring to him as her boyfriend before they were even dating. And she's like, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. But you could see there was this subtle smile there. And then once they started dating, I started referring to him as her fiance. And uh, then, if, then she's no, 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 we're not, we're not, you know, we're just, dating. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they married. And the father asked me, well, how did you know? I said, she, you could see when she saw this guy. Now she was a very virtuous woman at the age of eighteen to twenty, one of the most virtuous I've met. When she saw this guy, he was a virtuous man, and so there was this immediate. I, you could tell it was done deal. So. How, was the, how did he become a man? He was 19 years of age, ready to get married. How did this happen? Well, when he grew up, he did the hard work and responsibility route that everybody else did. In fact, the responsibility was so engendered in their family, and the hard work was so engendered in their family, they had this rite of passage that when you reach the age between 10 and 12, the father, whether you're a girl or a boy, the father would take you and drop you off. They owned massive acreages. He would drop you off, and, and by the way, by that time, he's already given you all the skills. He'll drop you off in the middle of one of these acreages and say, I'll be back in a week, clear the two acres. And of course, he would go and check on them once in a while just to make sure that there was no problem. The kids, knowing that this was a rite of passage, tried to, to mature and grow up as quickly as possible in a, in a rightly ordered way. They're the most balanced, some of the most balanced people I've ever met. The, the reason being is, is because if the father passed them up one year, like when they'd reached 10, the father said, no, ne maybe next year, they knew that they hadn't grown up enough yet. And so they would work hard at it again. And this is the, this is the difference. I mean, most kids today, you take most guys who are 30 years of age and drop them off someplace for a week, they'd starve to death. <laughs> so, um, but the point is, is I, I think the only thing he gave them was a knife and a machete to clear the brush. So, the point, but then they they do all the survival skills and they would actually survive, etc. And when they got through that week, they, it was. The, but this is the this is the the point is is that this was a case of a man who reached the age of eighteen years of age and was ready to marry. He wasn't, you know, and so I don't buy this thing of it's too young. No, it's not too young. It's just that we're too stupid in how we're raising kids today. Okay. Uh, when and why did men start to become dumbed down and effeminate? That's a great question. It started, okay. First of all, it started with Adam and Eve. I mean, I started with Adam, and that's the real problem. But it really became a problem in the modern culture when the, quote, greatest generation, unquote, when they were being raised, they didn't embrace their cross. The flip side to that was is that they kind of didn't really deny themselves any kind of real pleasures. If you look at what happened with the greatest generation during the Second World War, everyone's like, oh, it's the greatest generation because they won the Second World War. Yeah, did you ever pay attention to what they did during the Second World War? For example, most people don't know this, but the brothels in France were heavily visited by the American troops during the Second World War. This was a sign that morality was collapsing and had collapsed.
This generation was already starting that process. Then they raised the hippie generation, which basically did what? So when the greatest generation, because they wouldn't embrace their cross, to raise a kid and to make him suffer a little bit so he mans up, that requires a certain amount of suffering in yourself. And so what happens is they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to embrace their cross. And so they indulged the hippie generation. And so the hippie generation became, their generational spirit is indocility through intemperance. You can't tell them anything. You can't correct them. And all they want to do is feed their appetites. That's where it kind of began. Now, if you look at the history of it, it coincided with the flourishing of pornography, which if you know anything about that, the Soviet Union flooded the American market with money to back the pornography industry in the late 50s and 60s because they knew, they, they knew, if you, destroy men, if you destroy men's chastity, you will destroy their masculinity. And that's where it really kind of came from. So really, that's kind of where it all pivoted and started, and now it's just so out of control. It's just, it's all, they're not hopeless, because God can always bring good out of all this. Should boys, teens never play video games? It can't, video games can be legitimate recreation, depending on the particular video game, because they all have to be assessed about their own morality. Because some of the video games coming out now actually have real curses and spells in them, so you have to be really careful. But, so it can be legitimate, but it has to be um, moderated, very much so. So, and part of that basically comes down to the fact that um, uh, if, you, if you deny your kids any access to any form of technology whatsoever, unless you do an absolutely phenomenal job in raising them, as soon as they get off the reservation, they're going to be drunkards. That's basically what it's going to happen. They're going to go whole hog into it, or they're going to want it, and they're not going to see why they were denied it, etc. So they have to be, it has to be moderated in relationship to it. And when they're playing the video games, if they get a little bit out of control, you have to sit them down and say, okay, this is why we have to moderate, this is why we limit your time, this is why we, etc. So they understand that, okay, in relationship to this thing, I have to de demonstrate um, proper uh, virtues. This is one of the reasons why somebody emailed me recently because I've gone on public record saying the state does not have the right to tell you you can't teach your kid sobriety by letting him drink alcohol. And they're like, what do you mean? Someone under the, under the age of 19, first of all, under the age of 19 or 21 is purely an American invention when it comes to when you can drink. The fact of the matter is, is that in Europe and in the whole history of humanity, especially in Catholic history, is that the children were actually allowed to start drinking when they started going through puberty in order to master sobriety in relationship to the things so that when they got out, they had the virtue already. Well, what's happened? We don't let the kids drink, and then they go off to college, they get this thing, hey, this feels pretty good, and next thing you know, they're bombed all the time. Okay. So it's the same thing with technology. They have to you learn how to moderate themselves in a relationship to it. And they're not going to get that unless you yourself start out moderating them and then slow that up so that they, they can learn that themselves, not completely cutting them off from it. How much television per week is too much for a boy to become a virtuous man? I don't even own a television because I don't have time for one. But, but the fact is, is that with television... Um, I think anything more than an hour a day is too much for a guy, long term. I mean, it's one thing if you go through a week where you're kind of watching stuff or you want to sit down and you want to watch, you know, you want to do a, a marathon and watch all of the trilogy of Lord of the Rings or something. But, that's, but here I'm talking about, you know, if, the guy, if a kid is watching more than an hour a day or even 30 minutes a day, I, a day, I think that you're going to have problems long term. Teenagers are still growing, should, and again, this is dependent upon the kid, because virtue is, rel is a virtue, the mean in virtue is relative to the individual. So some kids, you can hardly let them have any access to it because they have no control. Other kids, you can just leave the thing open and say, well, whenever you want to play, because the kids, are, you, know, you know he's only going to look at the thing maybe a half an hour a week. Teenagers are, grow uh, are still growing, should they be allowed to snack in between meals? If I was younger, I would say definitely. But uh, um, I think it depends on what they're doing. I mean, if you're doing a lot of hard and heavy work, yes. And if the guy's in this growing spurt and stuff, you don't want to, you don't want to necessarily deny them. On the other hand, you don't want to give free reign to let them eat whatever they want to eat. You know, when I entered the fraternity of St. Peter, the first two things that you're confronted with when you step through the door is no more video games. Boom, they completely cut it out. And their basic attitude is, it's time to grow up. 
The second, and that's why I think video games are okay for young kids, etc., and, ki- and and even teenagers to a certain point. But then it certain, comes a certain point they have they should be phased out of a man's life. Um, I mean, you, when you see these guys playing hours and hours and hours of video game, you're just like, man, that's a, that's what a kid does. It's like St. Paul says, when I was a child, I acted like a child, I did the things of a child. But when I became an adult, I put away the things of a child, and that's what's not happening in our culture. Um, so, that's, okay, so the first thing is no more video games. The second thing is no more eating between meals. Not, and not just during Lent. It was just period. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me as far as learning how to moderate that side of things and just get to that. And now I can't even hardly eat between meals. Once in a while I can take a bit of something, but I can't. Uh, if I'm doing really heavy work, I can to some degree. But generally, I don't like doing a lot of eating between meals because once your body gets out of the habit of it, then you realize I don't necessarily need it. And that's the real thing about food. Once the saint one time said, actually reiterating what a number of saints said, he says, if you go to the dinner table and eat to the point where you eat all that you want and never get to the point where you deny yourself at least something in each meal, you're no different than a pig. And I think that's really true. Guys have to get to the point where they have to master that. And women, it's usually more, well, I'm worried about my figure, so I'm not going to be eating all the pasta anymore. But with guys, it's, I mean, that's less of an issue, and so they have to moderate it more through virtue. Um, the kid sins, and the parents gives him a punishment. But the kid says, I confessed it, I did the penance, now you can't punish me. Oh, I'm contraire. <laughs> There's two orders of justice. The first order of justice is between you and God. That's what the penance is, and that's what the priest gives you absolution for. But then there's a second order, which is the natural order of justice, and that's between individuals. And so when you commit a sin, like by disobeying your parents, let's just take that one. You commit an injustice not against, just not just against God, but also your parents. And so your parents have to punish you or have the right to punish you in proportion to the crime that you've committed because of the fact that that's necessary in order for you to learn right order. So when they say that, oh, you can't, you can't punch me, oh yeah, you can. Because in fact, it's the parent's obligation in some circumstances. Um, so two orders of justice. That's just the kid trying to get out from underneath his punishment. Tell him, hey, be a man, take your beating. All right. What are the good forms of discipline for a teenager that will not tear down but is effective? Yeah, there's the, the discipline, discipline can't be designed to demean. It has to be designed to order the person towards developing the virtue. And so, um, you know, forms of discipline, okay, you disobeyed your mother, go out and clean, you know, go out and rake the yard. You know, in other words, so that, it, that what he's doing has a right order. Or, you know, okay, so you hit your sister. Okay, well, go in and clean your sister's room for her. So there has to be certain things to do that, that you make them do that are difficult that they don't really want to do so that it, they have to learn that that's the... Um, and for teenagers, um, I think it's especially important that they learn the virtue of temperance. So, okay, you, with boys particularly, because boys can, boys can just be like the... I, I never watched the movie fully, but there's that one thing that um, it's in one of these um, horror movies where this plant would eat everything and feed me, feed me. I mean, that's the way boys get them at a certain stage where you just, you, you cannot fill them up. It's not physically possible, right? Well, what happens is, though, is, is that that's one of the ways that you can teach them. Okay, you hit your sister. This is what you're going to do. You know, you know, no more hot dogs for you for a month. Or something like that. Something that the kid is attached to. You say, no more of this. So that he learns that. But you don't want to demean the kid. Like saying, you're useless, you're worthless, etc. Because that doesn't serve any purpose as far as right, uh, rightly ordering them. In the end, all it does is wound them. And then it makes it more difficult for them to actually do the right thing. What is the symbolism behind the Beretta? Hmm. Uh, the symbolism is is that it's a sign of regality. That is, it's a sign of um, the ability to rule. So once a person was tonsured, um, they had this, and they became a cleric. He would wear that in choir as a sign of um, receiving jurisdiction from the church to perform certain functions. So it was a sign that, that you had the right to rule in some way. 
Um, and so even with uh, and so that it also is a sign of authority because just as a you know a king wears a crown as a sign of his authority so the priest wears something that's similar to a crown which is a beretta as a sign of his authority which is one of the reasons why I wear, wear it when I preach sometimes as a sign of if I have it available I'll actually wear it because it's a sign of the authority to preach and why is it proper for men to cover their head why is it improper for men to cover their heads in mass while it is proper for women good question St. Paul says that women are to cover their heads so that uh, at least they tempt the angels, right? Now, he's not talking about the angels in heaven. The angels in heaven don't have problems with chastity. He's talking about the men that are trying to lead virtuous lives in there. The, the veil for a woman serves to, serves to function. Remember when I said that a woman is given this natural inclination to be concerned about her appearance? Well, the minute she puts on her veil, it cuts that. She can't be worrying about how she's looking, underneath this veil because nobody can see it, right? So it helps her to maintain focus and not be worrying about what the guys are thinking about how her hair looks. The second thing is, is saying, Paul says the hair is a woman's crown, which means as a crown, it, it's kind of, it's a manifestation of glory. This is one of the reasons why when I see women with chopped hair and they're walking around with butch haircuts, I'm like, that is just so unfeminine. I mean, I could understand if she just had chemotherapy or something, but you're just like, what? You know, it's 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 uh, it's a sign of that. You know, that again, it's that feminine self hatred that you sometimes see. But in point of fact, that the hair is one of those things that attracts men, and so it has to. And the and the veil is to block women from. Uh, recognizing or for, brought women from worrying about their parents and from men from looking at based upon that dynamic which was designed in them at the time of the creation of Adam and Eve. The subsequent to that is okay, so why is it that men shouldn't cover their head? Because women don't look at men the same way. She's not looking at, look at that guy's hair. I just want to run my fingers in <laughs> the guy's hair. Women just don't do that. Right? So it's a, different, it's a difference based upon our psychology and why it's there. Okay. Although I did know one priest who had really long hair one time, and I said to him, do you think some of the women in your parish want to run their fingers through your hair? He says, have they ever said that to you? And he says, no, they've never said it, but I know there's a few who want to. <laughs> uh, he subsequently cut his hair. but And actually, he had long hair for a legitimate reason. So, Could you please explain the difference between a man controlling his wife and a man who exercises his authority? The man who controls his wife is doing it to sate himself, and he authority is based upon the principle of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is is that when the task is given, the uh, governing of that task is done at the lowest common le- the lowest level that is proper, so because the people at that lowest level will have a greater understanding of the circumstances, and so they'll know how it should be implemented. This is one of the reasons why centralized government is always bad, because they never know how these things apply, should be applied concretely. But that being said, when a husband, you know, just says, you know, I want you to start, you know, making sure that, um, um, you know, when we come for dinner that you know, that the kids are not just running around in mayhem and try and get it to the point where they're here, you know. Um, or, you know, so he asks her to do something, then he leaves it to her. He doesn't sit there and, you know, tell her, no, you can't use that spatula, you have to use this pink one and not the red one. Oops, I think we lost, you lost me. I'll just speak loudly. Um, it went red, I think the battery is dead, okay. So, <clears throat> it's not just that, and he, it's, in other words, he, lets, he just tells her, these are the tasks, this is what I want you to do, and then he leaves it to her, and he doesn't sit there and tell her individual. okay, this is how I want you to make my bed, this is how I want you to do this, I want my pillow in this position, I want this there, I want the kids to be wearing this color and not that color, that, that's a sign of controlling, because, and what that is a sign is, is that interiorly, he wants to feed his appetite in relationship to this thing, because his appetites are un- un- out of control interiorly, and so he wants to actually control her to make sure she's feeling that, feeding that appetite that's out of control. So that being said, whereas right authority would just would recognize two things. One is, um, you know, that, oh, sorry, three things. The first is, is that there's a right authority and that I'm just trying to maintain this authority and we want order in the house. And so um, there are certain things that the, the husband will simply leave to his wife to make determinations. Like for me, I think it's just absolutely ridiculous that a husband who's at work all day long comes home and tells his wife where she should store the pots and pans. 
Now, unless your wife has an IQ of 60, she should be able to determine those things because she's the one that has to deal with it. It's called the principle of subsidiarity. If she's the one using the pots and pans all the time, let her determine where she wants to put those things, right? Whereas if he starts controlling things without allowing her, if, you, if he gives her a task and then he wants to control how she does it, that's the sign of control. Whereas authority is, he asks her to do something that's for the benefit of the family and, then she, and he lets her do it, right? Okay, the third part of that is that um, in the controlling side of it, the husband um, has to, in addition to subsidiarity and watching his own affections in relationship to it, he has to be careful because if he tries to control his wife, then what's going to happen is she's going to rebel. And you will act controlling long-term destroys your authority. Because what happens is, if it's rightly ordered authority, people will help you to achieve the end for which the authority is trying to strive. If you're trying to control people, people will rebel because we're naturally designed to have a certain degree of freedom. And so this is what government today doesn't seem to understand. This is what some men don't seem to understand, is that is if you try and control, in the end, you're going to lose the authority that you already have. Okay. Um, how much time do we have? 20 minutes, okay. I grew up being told over and over to be self-sufficient and not rely on a man, provide for myself. I am guilty of the sin of usurpation. Any advice to stop this tendency? The first part of it is, is to recognize that, technically speaking, there is no human being who is self-sufficient. There is only one thing that exists that is purely self-sufficient, that's God. The rest of us, even angels, are dependent upon God for their existence and their function, uh, their, their, their ability to, to do the things, their activities. Human beings are not only dependent upon all of that, but they're also dependent upon each other. It's the very nature of it. In fact, the very structure and nature of a, of a family, which is the basic building block of the society, is because er, the, the, it's the basic the, re, the structure and nature of the family is there to provide for those who aren't self-sufficient. The wife will never be fully self-sufficient. It's impossible. How 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 can she do full justice to her obligations as mother, and also have a full-time job? She can't do it. I've known all these women who have done it, and they say, "I've tried to do that, but it never worked out." I've never met a woman who had worked full-time when she didn't have to. Now, sometimes women have to work full-time because of their circumstances. But if you're talking about a woman who says, no, I want a career, I want to be self-sufficient, I want to be able to do all these things, in the end, the children suffer because she's away from her primary obligations. The children have a self-dependency on her. She has a, she has a dependency on her husband. Not as a, that dependency is not a sign of lessening the individual. The fact that all of us depend upon God for our existence doesn't take away from us as human beings. It's the same thing with a woman. The fact that she depends on her husband to bring, um, the, you know, to bring home the paycheck so that she can stay home and take care of the children doesn't lessen her. What it does is it frees her to be able to focus upon taking care of the children, which is what her glory and her, her honor ultimately is in. So she has to look at that, that self-sufficiency as a complete fairy tale. There's no such thing. Nobody is self-sufficient. Even these guys are like, I like rugged self-sufficiency. Well, guys can be self-sufficient to a degree, but you still depend on the rest of society. You've got to go to the grocery store to buy your food, and even if you're growing your own vegetables, you're going to have to go buy a tractor to, that someone else made. There's always a degree of dependency. That's not the issue. The issue is, is, is the... the is the dependency upon the particular individual rightly ordered according to your state in life? If it is, then you have nothing to worry about. It's actually freeing because now that person can take care of it. The other side of it is, too, is, you know, when it comes to the authority, I never understood women in the slightest. Well, I do, but I'm just saying that for rhetorical purposes. Why would a woman want to take on the responsibility as she stands before God at her final judgment for the things in the home? Quite frankly, if I was a woman, I'd say, it's yours, honey, your problem. I'm not dealing with it. When I stand before God, I'm clear because it's not my responsibility. That's your problem. I mean, why take on, why put your head in the noose? 
His is already in it, so let him hang, so to speak. But the point is, is that she should just, that freedom, and you see this with women who don't usurp the authority of their husbands, who respect it and just leave it, then what happens is, is there's this tremendous freedom that the woman experiences, and then as a result of that, she can be truly who she is as a woman and as a wife and as a mother. Okay. How to, help, how, how to handle families when there has been abuse or addiction. Um, and then we got one more. With abuse and addiction, there's three different layers. There's three different layers, three different levels of consideration. The first is, is that the abuse has caused damage. It's the very nature of abuse. So the abuse has caused damage. The abuse has to be stopped. So that, so that people can start to heal in relationship to the abuse. So the first level is people just ask to, on a psychological and on a moral level, there has to be a healing process that they have to go through based upon the type of abuse that's occurred. Second, there has to be, um, and a lot of that involves forgiveness and things of that sort. Third, Oh, sorry, the first one is the abuse has to stop. The second part is the healing process has to begin. The third part is there has to be attention paid to the spiritual side of things. Because out of all the women who show up on my doorstep, 50% of them became possessed through no fault of their own. Out of that 50%, 80% of them were either raped, molested, or abused. So the attention has to be paid because a lot of times the abuse opens up whether it's verbal or psychological or what have you, or even physical or sexual, what happens is it opens up the door to the demons entering into the family unit. This is one of the reasons why I tell men, look, if you abuse your wife, it's the most unmanly thing that you can do. A, it shows a sign you don't have any self-control yourself. Second of all, you're opening up the door for the demons to step in when your whole function as a man is to protect them spiritually from those very things. Okay, that all being said, I should also say uh, the inverse is also the case. Because women can be abusive to men. I mean, they don't report it, but most people don't know this, that depending on the location you are at in the country, 25 to 40 percent of the domestic abuse is actually women beating on men now. Okay, that all being said. So there has to be attention paid to, is there a, is there a spiritual side of things that need to be tend to? I mean, did demons of obsession get into the family? Did there something enter into the family line? In the relationship to the abuse, is this a, a family historical problem? Is it a generational spirit that's being passed on? If it is, you better get it straightened out now because it's going to be passed on through your boys or through the daughters or what have you. So there's different levels. And so that's the, the main thing, though, is finding out what the abuse is, getting it stopped, get the healing process to begin, and then make sure that spiritual side gets straightened out. Okay. A male co-worker seemingly designs his attitudes and circumstances around doing less work, or not at all, so the rest of it, the team has no choice but to pick up his tab. What would be the most important virtu uh, virtuous example to show or teach in this scenario? Fire him. <laughs> no, um, or man him up. So... Um, you know, maybe all the women should take him behind one of the cubicles and slap him around until he says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my part. No. Um, I, think the, the, uh, I think that part of the virtue is the virtue of justice. Is If it can be done without grave inconvenience to you, you need to let him hang for his not doing his own work. So when you get the work done... When the time comes, if there's not some part that's not done, the boss says, why isn't this done? They say, well, this is the part assigned to Johnny. Johnny wants the story. In other words, picking up the tab just reaffirms him in his effeminacy. So you have to stop picking up his tab. The second thing is, is that um, I think he, depending on the circumstances, all the principles of fraternal correction being observed, he has to be called to task about it. Hey, you know, pick up your, pick up your slack here. You know, and because usually my experience is too with guys like that, they're masters of, oh, I, that's not my fault, is it? Yeah, yeah. Just do your job. But um, sometimes you have to out them even to the. I don't like I don't like triangulation though, where you go to the boss and say Johnny's causing the problem. You know, before the problem actually is recognized by the boss. Once the boss recognizes the problem, then you can just say, well, this was my job, I got it done. What about you, Johnny? 
Um, by the way, I hope there's no guy named Johnny here. So, but anyway, the point is, is that, that that's, I think the real issue is, is don't affirm him in his effeminacy and make sure that he has to pay the just price for it because that suffering he's going to go through will say, okay, the next job, I can't do this. Or he'll go to the next job and do the same thing and he'll get fired again and he'll just go job to job. But the point is, is that you don't want to let him get away with it because then you're just affirming him in his effeminacy. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I'll give you a blessing. If you'd like to kneel, you can. If you can't kneel, don't worry about it. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Supervos et Manet Semper. Amen.